Good afternoon, and welcome again to another Emmyscope ODS videos webinar. And I welcome everybody joining us across the world. And some of you, I realize it's probably middle of the morning, so I uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I, my name is Mark Richardson. I'm a marketing manager with Environment Technology, and I am again joined by Dan Ambre from Full Spectrum Diagnostics. And Tonight, or today, we are going to be uh, talking about ODS videos with a cell phone. Now, this is something unique. Who thought that, who ever thought you could do an ODS video with a cell phone? Um, traditionally, most of us do it with a high-speed camera, which always works, but I guarantee everybody on this call has a cell phone in their pocket, and it's certainly very easy to pull a cell phone out and take a video. So uh, in this webinar, we are gonna talk about that processing a cell phone video using the Emmyscope ODS video software. Um, with that, actually, before we get into that, let me talk a little bit of, uh, with the webinar itself. We are recording this, and uh, we will uh, be sending out a recording at the tail end of the webinar. Um, if you have questions, uh, please type your questions into the questions dialog box, and we will get those questions answered at the end of the webinar. Um, we have a lot of people joining us today, so it's just not possible to uh, to have everybody uh, speak their questions. So we're going to have everybody on mute for the duration of the webinar, uh, but please type your questions in and we will spend uh, time to get those answered at the end of the webinar. With that, let me hand things over to Dan and we will get started. Uh, hello and thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, my name is Dan Ambre. Uh, my company is Full Spectrum Diagnostics. I've been working with Vibrant Technology for about 25 years uh, in the field. So, uh, you know, they're a software company. They don't spend a lot of time in the field. And they need people like me to go and do unique things. And I I found one that just blew my mind uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was uh, what you're similar to what you're looking at right now. Um, it was a cell phone video. And Obviously, it's cell phone video. Its uh, frame rate has no glimpse of what uh, high-speed cameras go. High-speed cameras go to about a thousand or plus uh, frames per second. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen here is about 30 frames per second. Or yeah, 30 frames per second. Sorry, I lost my mind for a minute. Um, I put one of the videos on the website on LinkedIn uh, about two weeks ago. And it was a Friday afternoon, probably not the best time to get hits on uh, what you're posting. Uh, but I averaged, for the first five days, I averaged a thousand people an hour looking at this uh, this animation from a cell phone. And it, I'll show you it shortly here. But uh, it just blew my mind that there were that many people out there that were that interested. And um, some of you, I hope, are, saw that and you're on the you're on the webinar right now because of it. Um, one thing that makes this possible, and we're going to talk about a, several things, uh, is you have to have basically a low speed application. And that's what this wind turbine is right here. The image on the left is the raw uh, cell phone video when I was standing next to this wind turbine looking up with my arm at full length uh, trying to film it. And obviously your arm's going to move all over the place, which it did. And I just, you know, downloaded the picture and didn't worry about it. Um, I just found the picture uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, I tried out the the ODS videos on it and uh, I got what I have on the right. And this is color enhanced with contour colors, but um, I can see the tower, the natural frequency. The other one to the left is a time waveform, so you're seeing it rotate, um, but you're also seeing me bounce the thing around. What makes this uh, image go static uh, in the background is uh, some deflection at a point software that we uh, developed in the last month or two. And it uh, eliminates the background noise like you wouldn't believe and makes everything come to life. And now all the cell phone videos have, have a purpose. And I'll, I'll show you the uh, what they can do and what they can't do in a moment uh, when we start getting into it. But it's really exciting stuff. This is the image that, uh, one of the images that came off the website uh, or that I posted on LinkedIn. And you can see obviously that it's bouncing all over the place. That's the camera jitter. Um, the software uh, allows us to go in there and pick all the points around 
the unit that are moving with the camera and subtract it out of the frame and you get a nice uh, smooth looking animation. But this was a, um, a guy in a refinery up here in St. Paul. He sent me a video clip and he said, hey, what do you make of this? And I just threw it in the software and played with it and I was amazed that uh, I was seeing what I was seeing because the, the cameras that I've been using are you know, five, $6,000 cameras that um, take thousands of frames a second and this was just a cell phone. But a little more investigation, like Mark just mentioned, uh, everyone on this call has a cell phone and every cell phone has video camera of some sort. Okay, they're all different kinds and I'm not sure this is an iPhone that I'm gonna talk about, but the other um, LG phones and Galaxy phones and all that, I, have, I assume they have similar features. Um, one thing right off the bat is the cell phone produces a much brighter video image. And a lot of that is really due to the low speed of the uh, frame rate. At the high frame rates, uh, over a thousand feet per, or frames per second, it, you need lighting uh, if you're indoors, and just period. But the cell phones are, are a little better uh, and pretty high quality images come out of them. So uh, artificial lighting is not required for more, most applications. The cell phone's cheaper than high-end uh, video cameras. Uh, cell phones are more protected. I go in a lot of awful places like cement plants and uh, I was just in Arizona in a, a copper plant where they're pulverizing the rock and there's dust everywhere. And in my, I wouldn't even take my high-speed camera in there because it has a fan and it's an open housing and it pulls air through and it would just muck the whole thing up. Um, looking at my menu for my camera in the settings, and I mentioned again, it's an iPhone. It has a 720p at 30 frames per second. It has a 1080p at 30 and 60 frames per second. I guess the next wave is the 4K, which uh, is close to 4,000 points along one edge uh, pixels. And it has a 4K at 24, 30, and 60 frames per second. And that's not the greatest when you're talking uh, against 1,000 frames per second, but there are applications where this is gonna work. Um, 1800 RPM motor, uh, it runs at 30 hertz or 30 frames per second. Uh, uh, and same thing, it's the 3600 RPM motor runs at 60 frames per second. Uh, there is a Nyquist uh, factor that we're gonna have to look at so that we don't alias the peaks into the spectrum that aren't really there. And I'll explain that, that's a little confusing, so I have a demonstration. But there's two new features uh, in the last few years, the slow-mo features, which are down to the uh, bottom left there. It's 1080p, but it's higher frame rate. So it's 1,020 frames per second, or, or excuse me, 120 or 240. With the 240, we're getting up uh, more than twice running speed of uh, 36 RPM motors. So we're, we're getting in a range where we're not gonna have problems because of, uh, aliasing. Hard for me to say that today. Um, disadvantages. Uh, cell phone jitter in handheld applications like I did with the, the wind turbine tower. I'm all over the place, but we have a solution to that that's on the next slide. Uh, cell phone rates much lower than high-speed cameras. Uh, 240 frames per second is the highest my phone would do in comparison to 1057 that I normally use. Uh, cell phones process the a video image as a vertical scan, not as a, a, a simultaneous pixel cap, capture of each frame. So it has a slight phase shift along the, uh, as you go from top to bottom. And it amounts to about five degrees of phase, which in the world of operating deflection shape and phase analysis, we're looking for a phase value uh, plus or minus 30 degrees or so. So that five, uh, five degrees isn't gonna be a problem for doing videos. Uh, may require averaging to remove the noise floor. Um, little less resolution uh, and you, the noise floor plays a bigger part in the peaks in your spectrum. So uh, if we had some averaging and we're working on that now, uh, just in the signal processing end, uh, we have much better presentation, at least in the spectrum. Uh, there are options, the 720, the 1080p, the 4K, 
Uh, I saw a commercial for 5K uh, video out uh, just last night when I was watching basketball. Uh, frame rate limitations uh, for usable frequency range. Uh, frame rate limitations are, they work, these cameras, uh, cell phone cameras work best for low speed applications like this wind turbine. The wind turbine is turning at 14 RPM, so about a 0.25 uh, or so uh, revolutions per minute. So it's it's pretty slow application. Um, higher the frame rate, the darker the video image, and it it's, that shows up on the 240 uh, frames per second slow mo version. Uh, the lighting just gets darker and darker as you get higher resolution but you don't get too high, you still have a good uh, good video image. Now, what's helpful? Uh, we talked about this um, in a couple of webinars, a couple of the last webinars, and it's a, a little piece of software inside the Emmyscope ODS videos called Deflection Relative to a Point, and it's an algorithm that removes handheld camera jitter. So you select the background grid points, you have a grid overlay, you can select the background grid points, you uh, average the background, and then set it to zero. But you take that average and you apply it to all the points you haven't selected. So we, we're reducing the background uh, jitter uh, all the way in the background of the picture, but um, as much as we can in the image itself, in the remaining grid points and then uh, calculating a new time waveform and frequency spectrum data block uh, because we're effectively removing a bunch of the noise in the background. So we need, uh, re need to recalculate, but it's a very quick application and it's, it's phenomenal. I would have never guessed that you could do this um, with a cell phone, just, just handheld jitter, not speed of the frame rate or anything like that, just the jitter, it's almost impossible to uh, solve this problem any other way, and they came up with a way to do it. It's fantastic. I was in a, a, a crushing plant, a copper plant, uh, two weeks ago, and this was a 1800 RPM uh, motor, and I am, it, that's 30 hertz. I was uh, taking, you know, it has a rotational rate a little less than that, so it was 1765, something like that. Um, there's a lot is lost in the signal. There's a lot of signal processing problems, but uh, it's just under the Nyquist frequency and you can still animate this. So if I if I knew enough to set my dumb camera up to 24, 240 frames per second, I would have had a much different picture show up. So I'm still learning things. It's, it's, uh, it's really new technology and it's, uh, everybody can use it. It's amazing. Anyway, I can see a little bit of the misalignment that's occurring, and actually on the on the other side of the motor here, there's a coupling, and this is a shaft that uh, carries the pulley. So um, it's uh, somewhat loose. Uh, there's a belt tensioner up here, and uh, it's an interesting uh, animation. Uh, this was my way home from the job. I had a window seat. This is an aircraft engine. And there's two things that you're going to see. You know, every once in a while, you know, during the day, you can look down the end of it and you can see the, win uh, the wing flex. But this is something a little different. The image on the right uh, is the wing motion. So the engine's just going along for a ride uh, on the wing. The one uh, to the left here, it's ovalizing. The nacelle is, is physically going into an oval and it's uh, there's multiple... Um, uh, multiple orientations for that. It'll go into an oval, it'll go into a triangle, a square, a star. There's a whole bunch of different mode shapes for the for the nacelle. And you're seeing a, a, a time waveform version of that. So we're all, they're all trying to compete with each other. But if we had enough resolution, we could extract uh, each one of those modes out. And again, I didn't have the insight of uh, getting a higher frame rate, but it was a uh, I was uh, kind of interested in how this would respond and it turned out really nice. This is something you might've seen before if you've uh, come to one of these webinars. This was a vertical pump in a, um, 
uh, wastewater plant in uh, the Midwest here. Uh, I took a, a camera shot just from this distance, this vantage point, and the iPhone, it, it captures light like you wouldn't believe, and it comes up, this room was pretty dark, and you can see the lights stands down here with my LEDs. I had two of those shining up on it so I could see it a little bit better. Uh, my camera at 1,000 frames per second uh, didn't do a very good job because uh, it, it's a big light hog and the image is really dark. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to take a video of, with my uh, with my iPhone and see what it looks like. And then if I remove all the background noise, the jitter, all that, this is what I was left with. And this is the first bending mode, or they call it a read mode or first cantilever mode of the uh, the pump. Uh, basically a, a stand here with a motor on top. And they seem to have some motion in the foundation. Okay, so this thing was pitching, uh, first, first bending mode. Uh, I did a, a traditional ODS, which is with an accelerometer. So one accelerometer is mounted in a point of high motion. The other one walks around and takes a, a grid of measurements all across the structure. So I think we took uh, almost 100 measurements on this, and we did uh, loops of eight points at every interface. So we do one down here at the base, we do halfway up the pillar, or one third, two thirds. We go across each joint to see relative motion all the way up. Okay, so we really mapped it out. And the traditional um, ODS with accelerometers, the mode shape looked just, just like this which was nice to see. Now, why does this work? It's because uh, it's low speed. 450 RPM, it's about seven and a half hertz. Um, I filmed it in 60 frames per second. So if I divide those two, uh, my Nyquist criterion is uh, supposed to be two to oversample. I have a factor of eight, mean, meaning I have a lot of oversampling uh, in this application. This is my wind turbine, and again, this is uh, before I um, went and processed the video. This is just the raw image and my handheld jitter. This is, and I did try this a couple of times, and I couldn't hold it still enough. It was frustrating, but I thought I'd never use this video again. This is that same video after the back background is processed, and you can see there's a, a little blockiness to this edge. Uh, and that's due to the number of grid points in there uh, that I'm uh, trying to isolate. So I, I select all the sky portion and uh, remove that background noise. And what I'm left with is something that looks like it's supposed to. This is the first bending mode of the tower in the lateral direction here. And it has a little bit of a pitch in the nacelle up here as well as it's going. Um, Interesting motion. They were having, uh, they had a balance guy in who was really worried that the tower natural frequency was too close to the uh, rotating speed. And uh, this proved where that tower frequency was. So basically, it's a modal analysis, a non contact uh, modal analysis with uh, tens of thousands of transducers. So every pixel in here is a transducer. Another look at this uh, in a more practical way. Uh, it was sped up uh, or set up to look for this tower natural frequency, and we found it. So that's easy to find. Um, I put some contour colors on it so you can see it a little bit better. The red is the highest vibration and green is the lowest. Um, so you can see what's going on. It's a rigid body. Uh, the whole tower is, is flexing like an antenna on a car. This is interesting. This is two different frequency. They're blade modes. So there's a little bit of tower interaction because the blades pass the tower and they pulse each other because you're you're squishing the air in between the blade and the tower and you get a pulsation three times every revolution. When that happens, you're exciting the blades. So the blade will ripple all the way up to the end. And I didn't back up far enough on this one, but um, you can see there's a pattern of ripples in there. This is a different uh, ripple pattern. You know, some of it looks very similar, but uh, they're all different mode shapes. So the 
there's probably 15 or 20 different mode shapes of the blades. So very interesting uh, because these blades, they're uh, a lot of them are wood inside, lightweight wood with uh, balsa wood type thing with uh, high strength plastic uh, housings on them and uh, they crack. And this is uh, good indications of what's going on in these blades uh, and where the high stress points are without uh, having to do anything. It's the natural motion of the structure. This is interesting. I've been wanting to get shoot a picture of the end of a shaft so I could see what the orbit patterns look like. And this was a pulley that had a lot of tension problems. So in the time waveform analysis, the one that kicked on first over here, you can see all the different patterns. There, there's nothing normal about that and linear. Uh, if I, ex it's time-based, so it's all the frequency simultaneously. Over here, it's frequency-based, and I chose the turning speed of the rotor, and I get just the rotor contribution. And so you might look at this and say, well, that's pretty good. Well, you better look at it in the time waveform and verify it's good because this had lots of motion that was uh, unacceptable. Uh, this is the one of the videos that made such a stir uh, this last week on LinkedIn with 120,000 people looking at it. That still blows my mind. Uh, it's a short clip. It was a guy in a refinery took it and he sent it to me and I couldn't open it and I asked him to send it again and, and finally I got the got the clip in and did the enhancing software, uh, removing the background noise and uh, I came up with two two modes um, and it's an 1800 rpm motor so I had uh, uh, just just the right amount of uh, frequency range uh, to see the 1800 or close to it. Anyway, uh, it, it begs the question, what's wrong with it? Uh, is the coupling misaligned? Is it loose? Is the foundation giving us problems? I think yes to all of that. But the thing is on this one, I would need an end view to see what's going on. Right now, I have a nice look at what the thrusting in the axial direction is doing and with the vertical direction. But I have no idea in and out of the page here what's going on. Okay, If I had an end view, it would give me a much better idea of how this, uh, this machine is twisting and what's causing it. Um, this is a couple of different uh, measurements. This is in a cement plant. Um, this was one of the bearing housings that had a bolt in it right here. Here's my uh, part of the frame for the tensioner, and here's my accelerometer, and uh, I can animate it. Uh, a lot of the motion is vertical, so I'm not seeing as much vibration uh, as I think I should. And in fact, it looks looks a little strange. I put my uh, graphics on here. I can uh, do the amplitude and, and phase at a point and uh, see how these points are moving. And you can see a little bit better, it is coming in and out of the page. So it isn't a, a horizontal and, or vertical or what have you orientation. It's uh, the orientation uh, coming out of the page. And I didn't have any other directional shots. Uh, only I had a short period of time to capture this. Uh, this is with color contour plots on it and with an orbit plot. So it's the same. Uh, structure, I just added color to it so I could gauge how much vibration was present in what direction it's coming in. So I have uh, this orbit plot, we got about 90 to 120 degree out of phase motion between the bearing housing and its mounting foot and the, the frame on the other side. Okay, And I can see the, the amplitude up here, this amplitude's in inches per second or velocity. In most rotating machinery applications, Velocity is the best parameter to look for severity problems. Uh, not acceleration, not displacement, but velocity. And in this software, um, we have integration and differentiation tools that we can jump from displacement to velocity to acceleration and backwards if we wish. Uh, a couple uh, 
couple of weeks ago, we had a webinar and I went out into a, a Walmart parking lot and I impacted the, um, the pole up here. So I had a, a big hammer, uh, hit it this way and I hit it that way uh, individually. And this is the one that's going this way. Um, hit it, walked back a few steps, started filming with my camera and enhanced it with uh, the software took all the sky motion and traffic and all that stuff out of here. And you can see the canvas is moving, the frame is moving. Um, I color contour it and get mostly getting washed out by the frame, uh, by the canvas motion, but you can see how it's, it's bending in there. Okay, so it was natural frequency testing without uh, any of the real fancy stuff. And I can see what modes. Okay, have a um, an example here, and this I mentioned aliasing a couple of times. Um, this is my test article. So I have a a little fan that came out of a heater, and I don't know why it's not no keeps stopping on me. But it has five blades. It runs at 2,200 RPM, something like that, 2,327 and it has five blades, so it's blade passing is five times that running speed, okay? Um, we get into a problem with uh, video analysis that we don't have anymore in uh, digital signal processing in, um, uh, what do you call it, with accelerometers and data acquisition units and things like that. Uh, we have an Fmax, which is really a Nyquist criteria, and F max that we use, that's our maximum frequency range and everything else is cut off. How do we know everything's cut off? Uh, we've oversampled by a factor of two at the minimum. So when I actually take my um, camera out and I open up the frame rate, uh, a thousand frames per second is this 31,710 frames per minute. So it's out here somewhere total frame rate. If I apply my Nyquist factor and cut it back to the F max, um, I get uh, a good assurance that I'm sampling fast enough to not have this aliasing problem. In this case, I don't have that. I was using the cell phone, so it, inherently it's built in. And I chose just the right um, piece of hardware here that has a high speed and it has higher frequency blade pass frequencies. And I can show how this works. So the aliasing is defined as the phenomenon in which a high frequency component in the frequency spectrum of the signal takes the identity of a lower frequency component in the spectrum of the uh, sampled signal. The sampling rate is too low, basically. I need to oversample at a higher rate. Here's what we'd see, and here's what I did see. This is uh, the spectrum that came from this application. So I turned this thing on. I took a um, a uh, a uh, video clip of that uh, for, I don't know, 10 seconds or so, and then I uh, I processed it, and here's my spectrum, and I can identify a bunch of things. Here's my turning speed, one times RPM. There's twice turning speed, three times, four times. I know there's five blades, so this is the blade pass frequency, and I'll get multiples of that. Here's one times blade pass, which is five times RPM. Here's two times blade pass, 10 times RPM. Out here, I'm going to have three times blade pass, four times blade pass, five times blade pass. Okay. Normally, I wouldn't think anything about this stuff that's beyond F max because it doesn't concern me. Now, in the case of uh, video footage like this, um, we have an aliasing problem. We don't have um, analog filters that can cut off that uh, high frequency end. So uh, a weird thing can happen. We, these peaks that show up at the higher blade pass frequencies can roll back into the spectrum, okay? So they call it a folding frequency. So F max is my, where I fold it. This is just above F max, my 15 times running speed. If I fold it back over as far as I am from X max, F max here to the other side, I find this peak. This peak is not a running speed harmonic. It's not a blade pass frequency multiple. It turns out to be caused by blade pass frequency, 
but it's an, uh, uh, an aliased peak from this uh, response out here, okay? If I come out here to the four times, my folding frequency is still F max. So I know how many um, cycles per minute that is. I subtract it back here. Here's another peak that's aliased. It doesn't really exist, but the, um, the signal processing parameters from undersampling cause it to show up in a different lower frequency range, okay? So here's the four times blade pass frequency or 20 times RPM. And here's the aliased version of that. So it's uh, you take whatever this distance is and you roll it back that way, and you find a peak there. Same thing here, and it's beyond the scale here of my five blade pass, folds around F max, and I'm all the way down here. So it's it's it picks out. Uh, it, they're all non-synchronous frequencies. The uh, the red, all the alias frequencies, and all the um, blue ones are the synchronous frequencies or the multiples. So harmonics of, of turning speed. Anyway, that's that's how that works. There's a formula for it that that is helpful, um, and I used everything in RPM or CPM cycles per minute. So uh, I have an Iquis factor times whatever my F max is minus the sampled frequency. Okay, two is my Nyquist factor. That's what I apply all the time. So I sample the frequency uh, twice as fast as it needs to, uh, and that's your minimum for the um, Nyquist factor, uh, 31,700 is 528 hertz. This data was taken with 1,057 frames per second. So my F max is half of that. So it's 31,700, okay, or 528 hertz. So I put it into the equation. It's going to tell me where the, um, the aliasing frequency is. In this case, uh, twice times the F max minus wherever this high frequency multiple of blade pass is, and I get 28,506 right there. Uh, same thing, but I'm looking, I'm concentrating at uh, four times blade pass frequency. I get 16,785, there it is. And the last one, I have Nyquist factor of two, F max of uh, 528 Hertz or 31,710 cycles per minute subtract out wherever that blade pass frequency is, the five times, fold it back in, and I get this 5183. So it's, it, oversampling's good, and it's the best thing we can do, uh, but in a video format, there's no anti-aliasing filters, no analog filters to cut off the uh, video at a high frequency end, like you can with an accelerometer. You can apply a, a real, quick uh, drop in uh, filter and it'll you know, pretty much extinguish any high frequency energy from getting through. And then you don't have to worry about the aliasing. But in video, we always have to. We're always gonna have uh, issues, okay? This is the way to check them. So if you got a strange frequency in here, look for orders of running speed, one, two, three, four, five, orders of blade pass frequency, something that's high enough energy that can cause the aliasing to uh, fold over and show up in your spectrum. And this might not make a whole lot of sense. It's kind of deep in the woods for uh, just a, a webinar on video stuff, but um, it's something you'll run into. Okay, uh, I took my iPhone and remember on that second page in, uh, there was 720p at 30 frames per second, 1080p at 30 and 60 and 4K and slow-mo, we did an example of all those. Um, I don't know why these are stopping on me. Okay, well, anyway, um, this is the spectrum from the 720p at 30 frames per second. If I go 30 frames per second, the software cuts it in half, so it's 15 frames per second, which is 900 uh, RPM. Okay, so that's my F max. Um, I don't have the one times RPM in this spectrum. It's out here at uh, 2327. So the only thing I'm seeing, I'm seeing a couple of peaks. They could be real peaks or they could be um, aliased peaks of some frequency above uh, F max, but I couldn't find that frequency. So I decided that these were 
oops, these were rigid body modes just from the video. So I put the color on so you can see it kind of rolling. Sorry about that. So you can see it kind of rolling through the screen. So I think it's pitching about this line. This one, it's doing something similar, but it's not quite the same. If the housing has a little different mode to it. So there are a couple of rigid body um, modes of this fan. Uh, other thing you'll notice compared to my high speed video, I can't see the blades on the other units. So the high, the lower speed, it's the, you know, 30 frames per second isn't fast enough to slow those uh, blades down enough for me to grab them and look at them. Okay. So those are probably rigid body modes. Come on. There we go. This is a uh, 1080p at 30 frames per second. So a little more resolution. Uh, the peaks are sharper, which is nice, uh, but I'm basically getting the same results. Okay, so just looks uh, a little better. This is the other one. So there's some rotational motion. There's rigid body. Uh, it's a fan that's sitting on a piece of foam, so it's free to bounce around a little bit. And it does have, if you jump back here, I put a couple blobs of putty on here. So it's unbalanced. So it will wobble about a bit. So we did that for the 1080, 30 frames per second. This is the 60 frames per second. Um, I have a, a 1,030 and 1,290. I do not have my 2327 coming in yet. It's still out here. Um, so there might be some aliasing going on with some of these peaks, but uh, these also look like rigid body modes. And kind of a, well, torsional kind of whirl mode to it. This is the 4K at 24, uh, 24 frames per second. So the resolution doesn't look real great. We, uh, uh, things started coming up. I could see rigid body modes at roughly the same frequencies. And the motions look the same. They look like uh, uh, pitching and, and whirl of that structure. And get me to uh, 30 frames, 4K at 30 frames per second. I have my rigid body modes again. And I shut this down and turn it on multiple times so the frequencies aren't quite lining up perfectly, but um, you get the idea. Okay, this is uh, 4K at 60 frames. You see the resolution looks better. Uh, if we had some uh, sample, uh, some averaging, we'd take the noise floor down as well. We might be able to see some natural frequencies show up. Um, and again, it's you know, rigid body motion. We're not there yet as far as seeing the rotation of the shaft. This is 3600. So uh, that's my F max, 120 frames per second. Uh, Nyquist says uh, you have to have a minimum of two for your Nyquist frequency. So you're dividing the 120 frames per second by two, and that gives me an F max of 3,600. And we have uh, our one times RPM is at 2,308, okay? It's showing up in my spectrum. I have 3,600 frames or F max, 3,600 uh, CPM F max. I use my equation to find the alias frequencies because I have a couple of anomalous frequencies in here. Um, Nyquist is two, the F max is 3,600 out here. Um, I multiply those together and subtract uh, whatever peak I'm interested in. This is twice running speed. So 4616 is out here and we'll see if that folded back in and it folded back to 2584, which is this peak, okay? Uh, I got another one. I have, I'm doing three times RPM. So three times RPMs out here, even farther. Uh, Nyquist is two, two times F max minus the three times RPM peak. And I get 276. There's my alias frequency for that. And this is a harmonic of that peak. These three peaks are uh, 
have the same spacing, that 276. So I don't know what this one is. This one's a weird one, um, but uh, we do have uh, aliasing going on in video. So this shows you for sure, especially at you know the low speed settings. Um, this was at, uh, ooh, is that slow-mo before? Yeah, that was. Sorry, folks. Um, this is a uh, slow-mo setting at 240 frames per second. So now I divide by two, that's 120. 120 hertz is 7200 CPM is my F max. So I'm getting pretty far out here. So I can... Sorry about that. Dumb phone doesn't know. Doesn't ring all day and then it rings when I'm on the phone. Um, so I have one times RPM, uh, 2290, 4581, three times. So one, two, and three times out here. Uh, I believe I looked at uh, what the blade pass frequency was. So two times 72 minus 9163, uh, I get 5236, which is right here. Um, I go in, I get my two Nyquist times my F max minus uh, the frequency out here I'm interested in, might be four times or five times, what have you. Um, and I get 29.45 and there it is there. So this is good data, uh, all three of those peaks. These peaks in here are aliased, this is suspect. You know, there's little peaks in here that we're finding. So this is all part of that uh, signal processing problem known as aliasing. And in the future, we'll get higher frame rates out of these uh, cameras and new slow-mo motion. They're already a quarter of the way there to what I use in the real expensive cameras. So it won't take that long. Um, so that's bas basically all I have today. Hopefully you have some uh, questions and I haven't confused you too much. It's just there's so much happening uh, that it's, it's amazing how we're learning new stuff all the time. Um, if you have a tight budget or a quick job, we can do rentals, uh, rental cameras, lights, stands, tripods, roller bag. Uh, I think it's $3,075 a month. Uh, just call sales at vibetech.com or email them. Uh, if that's great, but you don't have any time to learn this stuff, I can do it for you. I can get a quote. I can come in, do some on-the-job training. Um, and show you how the camera works, you know, before you decide to buy one, if you're interested. Uh, I would encourage you to pay me to do this, but uh, we can always, everything's negotiable. Uh, what does it cost? What do I need? Starting from scratch, uh, a full package is camera, tripods, light kit, and the Emmy Scotes ODS video software. Um, starting from scratch, it's just about 20 grand. Uh, the competitors are two and a half times that right now, and, or higher. So even now, if you don't have to buy a camera, uh, and we just wait a little bit for the cell phones to get better and better, every time I buy a camera, it gets better and better. Uh, we're going to go that direction. If you already are an Emmy Scope user, there's a big discount because you probably have uh, ODS videos or some other um, signal processing that uh, you've been using and that'll take down the cost of uh, your package. So it goes down to maybe 14,000 uh, for the software, the, the camera, the kit, all that. So there's something for everyone. Uh, it is a really unique time uh, in new ways to process vibration data. And uh, there's some naysayers out there that say you can't really do that because of these problems. Uh, hopefully I showed you with the aliasing, that's the problem they're really talking about. There, it's low resolution and it's, uh, you know, doesn't have enough speed to the frame rate and all that. But uh, we can get things, we, the more we know about this, the more we can judge whether it's really a factor or not. So that's all I have, Mark. All right, well, we got a few questions here. Uh, first question from Sean. On the page with the five blade fan regarding aliasing, how is the F max determined? Uh, the F max, here, let me go to that page. Um, 
Uh, doo, doo, doo. Right here. How is the F max determined? Um, the F max is uh, whatever your frame rate is. So if I had, not exactly, um, the F max in uh, any vibration situation, no matter what you're doing, is set by how fast you you sample uh, the signal. So if my F max, uh, let's say it's my frame rate is 1,057 frames per second, the Nyquist factor says you have to oversample your sample rate by a factor of two. So if I had 1,057 uh, frames per second, my F max would be half of that. Some signal processing and digital acquisition, uh, a lot of your walk around data collectors, it's not a Nyquist factor of two, but it's 2.56 or something like that. Real seriously uh, intricate uh, analyzers and acquisitions, you might go to Nyquist factor of three. So the minimum's two. Uh, the Emmyscope software automatically sets a Nyquist factor of two. So it's half of whatever you, you process. So I'm shooting video at 1,057 frames per second. My F max is 528 uh, frames per second. Okay, that's the usable portion. So it's half of my um, my uh, sample rate for the video, if that makes sense. Okay, moving on. We got a. Uh, this was a comment from Brennan. Brennan. Brennan here, who submitted the cooling tower video to Dan. I'm amazed to see what a curiosity of right. mine has evolved into. Awesome work. He's, he's the coolest you, guy ever. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, no question, question, Brennan. Come on. <laughs> There's still time. Uh, next question here. This is a uh, this is a long one here. Is it possible to carry out a video ODS to a vibrating screen machine? or to ball mill, which is rotating, to look at some structural parts of the machines which are having important deformations, which is having large movements uh, yeah, as it is normal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, on foundations, it's it's amazing what you'll see. Um, I, I, I'm going to do a ball mill next week, actually, uh, in a raw mill in... Um, well, I can't say where it is, but um, that's one of their concerns was the bearing pedestals. You know, how are they behaving and are they vibrating or moving into a, you know, a misaligned shape uh, when they're running? This is all about uh, s speeding up and, and slowing down the motion, speeding up the frame capture so that you can see little subtle things going on, a loose bolt or, you know, something coming unloaded or a crack opening, what have you. But he's right on track. I mean, you can take, you don't have to shoot the whole ball mill. You can go and shoot one foot of a bearing pedestal and see how, how it's reacting. Um, and there's no, you know, rule of thumb here. You just shoot a bunch of videos and go back and see which ones you like. I, the only rule of thumb I've ever heard about this is uh, you might take 10 or 12 uh, pieces of video uh, before you get a good good one that you want to keep, you know what I mean. So but, yeah, a, right on the track. Follow up here. He says, "I'm not asking about foundations, but for the rotating drum, the cylinder itself." Well, uh, you can see it. Obviously, you can see it rotate. You could, uh, when you uh, take video, you can slow that motion down um, or speed it up. Uh, you can put color contours on it. You can see how the drum is deforming. Um, and if you do it just right, you know, it's it's hollow on the inside, so it might go into some ovalization shapes, kind of similar to uh, the airplane engine nacelle uh, that we showed earlier. Um, I'm still not quite sure what question he's asking, but. I think you, yeah, it says, uh, thank you for your answer. I think we answered it for him. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question from Vladimir. Uh, if I want to use my cell phone, do I just need the Emmyscope software to process the video? Uh, yes, you do. I can answer this one. Um, if you already have Emmyscope and you want to just use your cell phone, 
um, you can purchase uh, basically the the package, if you will, for ODS videos. Uh, and that package uh, is uh, what we call the 6,000 and it is available for $9,000. So you can simply just purchase that piece if you wanna add, add the ODS videos, the OD, what we call the ODS upgrade package. Uh, and that's- But you're, let me chime in here. You're, you mm -hmm. still might think about, it's not the whole thing that you have. You do need a high-speed camera. You probably do need some lighting. Because if you're like me, most of my work is indoors in, in dark plants where, you know, the lighting isn't good for high speed cameras. You can still take the low speed cameras, but then you got to worry about the aliasing frequencies and, you know, what's going on, what's true and what isn't. But um, it's not the end all be, be all. Uh, and whenever I do video ODS, I do traditional ODS as well. And that's something that you should consider. You can do do that uh, with your accelerometers. So you need a data acquisition front end and you can uh, you can do normal ODS with the accelerometer transducers as well as video. Yeah, sounds like he already has Emiscope. He just wants to add the ODS videos package. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Vladimir, we can do that for you. Absolutely, it's uh, the, BES 9000 option is what you're looking for. So you can just uh, email us and we'll get that uh, set up for you. Uh, let's see, another question on here is, um, if I wanna look at this video again, how do I do it? Uh, Stan, you are, you'll get a, uh, a webinar link. Um, emailed to you at the tail end of this after uh, go to webinar processes the recording of this they will automatically send it out and we will also post this uh, a recording of this webinar up on our uh, website so you can take a look at that uh, let's see here kind of scroll down here let's see if we have some other ones Bear with me here, just. Uh, okay, I think that might be it for now. If you have some additional questions, we got a few minutes here if you wanna fire them out. I did misspoke. I misspoke on the cost. The VES 9000 ODS video processing is 6000. So I had that backwards. <laughs> uh, if you just want to add the ODS video processing, it's $6,000. Uh, well, that would answer your question there, Vladimir. Let's see if we got here. But it's worth 9000 is what you're saying. There you go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Uh, that's it for questions right now. You must have answered a lot of good, uh, answered everybody's uh, questions in the webinar. Usually we have a few more. Um, well, maybe I can coax some of the people on the line here what they want to see uh, in the next webinar. Um, you know, yeah, if you got some ideas, idea. you want to shoot them in. Uh, here's a question. Why use the label Fs? Fs? Yes, label Fs, Fs, I guess, label Fs. Fs, oh, F sub uh, S. the frequency of the signal processing, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, this one, the sampled frequency is the, out in that range. Which high-speed camera do you recommend? Me? Uh, uh, that's, that was a question that came in. <laughs> uh, the, uh, Stan, we recommend the the Kronos camera. We've been recommending that now. It's it's a very uh, cost effective camera. That's what Dan uses. Do you have a you got a picture of that? You could pull up the. I don't nothing. Um, if you go to um, 
Krontech, K-R-O-N-T-E-C-H. I believe it's Krontech.ca. It's a Canadian company. Uh, you can get uh, information on the Kronos. Uh, they have a 1.4 and a 2.1, um, two different uh, cameras that we've, what we've, we've used uh, and we recommend. And we also uh, sell as part of our package. So uh, there's details up on our website as well. Oh, yeah, there you go. There he is. The camera. There's the one four. Uh, they got a lot of features. Uh, comes with different lenses if you want. There's a bunch of input output uh, strategies for the side here. Uh, different cards. So you can get an 8, 16, or 32 gigabyte um, of RAM. It's in color or monochrome. Uh, nice camera. Really, really responds well. Yeah, and the 2.1 just has a higher resolution, right? That's yeah. The, the primary so, difference. Yeah. yeah, I think it has a few other bells and whistles, but and it does have a different lens on it as well. Yeah, that lens. Uh, uh, this lens will not be interchangeable with the 2.1. Right, right. And I believe I it's just a couple thousand dollars more for the 2.1. Yeah. And Stan just asked, can it be applied outdoors? Sure. Outdoors, you don't have to Absolutely. worry about the lighting. It's the best way to do it. Yeah, the package that uh, that we sell includes lights, includes the tripod, includes the camera, of course, includes the software. So um, it's basically a, a, a turnkey solution that, that we, we can provide to you. If you uh, if you have nothing right now, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, that's about it. I don't see any other questions for now. Why don't we uh, go ahead and wrap things up? And uh, again, I appreciate everybody jumping on, and I thank you uh, for attending this. And we will have another one spun up next month, so stay tuned to your email, uh, and we will have another invitation out soon. Uh, and if you, again, if you have any ideas on some stuff you'd like us to cover, if you have some uh, webinar topics you'd like us to take a look at for you, please send them in. We'd love to. Uh, we love their feedback, and we'd love to hear from uh, what you're, what you got going on out in the field. And uh, if you got some good ideas for us, we'd be happy to cover them for you. Uh, again, you'll get the uh, link to this recording of the webinar. It should be in your uh, inbox. Uh, probably in a few hours, actually, it takes go to go to webinar a few uh, hours to process and and then they send out that link. So um, stay tuned for that. Any last words, Dan? No, I think I'm all worded out. All righty. Sounds good. Everybody have a great day. Be safe. And we will talk to you again soon. Take care.